Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe. This is the word of God. I believe what God says. Because it is impossible for God to lie. Wow. Today I want to talk to you. Today I want to talk to you about secret hurts. Now there was a psychology study, and how many of you know that all psychology studies are true? <laughs> no, they're not. But you know, you can find out some stuff. You know, they, they said, you know, like 98% uh, of the people in the next election are going to vote for the president. And somebody says, well, how do they know that? And they said, well, they did a survey. Well, where did they do the survey? Well, they did it at the Republican National Convention. <laughs> well, you know, surveys depend on who you survey. You can survey one group and get one answer and survey another group. But these psychologists that have to do with, uh, actually to do with the Mayo Clinic, they said in all of the people that they surveyed, and I don't know how they did this, if they got them in a little room and put a light in their face like the FBI and, and interrogated them, I don't know how they did it. But what they discovered was 100% of the people that they surveyed, everyone, once they talked to them long enough, once they got the doors open to their heart and to their minds, they discovered everyone had secret thoughts that nobody knew. Their wife didn't know, their husband didn't know, their kids didn't know. Now, it doesn't mean that this was a secretive person or that it was a bad person. And it went on to say that these were not necessarily bad secrets they were keeping from somebody. But they were things that over the years have developed that people have in their heart that nobody else knows about. And when it comes to the things of God, God wants to 100% cleanse us in such a way that we can live on this earth completely offense-free, hurt-free, with the joy of the Lord flowing out of our hearts, with, with no secret hurts that we're living with on a daily basis that you can't tell anybody about because it's a secret. And you know that God knows, and sometimes you even talk to God about it. But you wouldn't talk to your best friend. You wouldn't talk to your counselor. You wouldn't talk to your spouse or your kids. Why? because it's extremely personal and because you've kind of given up on it. You really don't believe anything will actually change. You're either too big or you're too small. You're too tall or you're too short. You're, you're too dark-skinned, you're too light-skinned. You're too young, you're too old. You're too educated, you're too uneducated. You're, people come up with a thousand different reasons why what they're believing for will never happen. And they tuck it away, and they, and they come up with this. Well, that's just the way it is. And sometimes if you ever open your heart and you share it with somebody, your friends will say things like, well, that's just the way it is. Just suck it up and live with it because nothing's going to change. And so we need to understand that sometimes the circumstances don't change. But we have within us the reality that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And we can rise above these secret hurts and we can get to the place where they don't hurt anymore. Wouldn't it be nice to wake up in the morning and not just outwardly but also inwardly you're completely free from hurts. See, now most people have a best friend and some people even get a counselor from time to time. And some people like to call the, the psychic hotline or the psychotic hotline or, or, or whatever, you know. And, and you just get, you know, somebody eating potato chips, watching television, talking to you out of the side of their mouth, reading off a script. Look, 
The source of your deliverance is spiritual. It's good to get advice. The Bible says we can get advice. But if you're going to get advice, you've got to get advice from somebody that's wise. Major problem in the church today is people walking around with hidden hurts. And I believe that it's not God's will. I believe it's God's will for us to break free of this. So that the smile on our face is not just something that's superficial, but it's something that's from deep inside. And we have the joy of the Lord and the glory flowing through us in such a way that the world will be attracted to us. You know, children can spot a phony. People can spot hypocrites. We need to have the true joy of the Lord flowing through us. And the only way to do that is to get every room cleaned out. You know, it's almost like our, our inner man is a, kind of like a building. Just picture an old building over in England someplace, an old abandoned place where Lord Grantham used to live or whatever. <laughs> it's got a lot of rooms. It's got, in fact, it's got so many rooms that some rooms have not been opened in years. There may even be an attic, there may not be. Is there a room upstairs? Is there a cellar in the basement? See, look, your heart is that way. There are rooms in your heart you go into every single day. And the, the bulk of your heart is well kept, clean, but there's rooms that you haven't visited since you were a child. And some rooms you've even forgotten about to the point where you just really don't think it's a good idea to open that door God wants us to open those doors and to clean out those rooms that our entire house is clean and then we can truly live with the joy of the Lord let's take a look at some scriptures Matthew 18 7 we've looked at this many times it says woe to the world because of offenses for offenses must come but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. This is basically telling us something. That there are offensive people in the world. You shouldn't be one of them. But later, Jesus talks a lot about we can't take that and bring it inside. You know, some of you have had spouses. Spouses that maybe you don't even have anymore. They've hurt you. You've had parents that have hurt you. I, I talked with a young man the other day. I, I say a young man. He's probably almost as old as I am. But I talked with a man the other day and asked him about his father and uh, what his father did for a living. The only thing he could remember about his father, the only thing is how his father used to beat him with a belt. That's the only thing he could remember. My dad beat me with a belt. I mean, it's the first thing that came out of his mouth. He said, oh, my goodness, I can't believe I even said that. All these decades, and the only thing he remembers is dad beat me with a belt. Well, you know what? In our discussion, we found out his dad beating him with a belt was a sore spot in his heart. And just like a sore spot on your body, you don't touch that sore spot. And how do you not touch it? Well, you know it's there, but you, you always go around it. You know, it's time that we put some spiritual antiseptic on this stuff. We, it's, it's time that we don't just cover it up with a Band-Aid. It's time, it's time to get healed, church. I said it's time to get healed of these secret hurts and these things. You know why they call it the past? It's because it's past. And I think we need to let go of the past. Like Paul said, looking forward, we need... That joy before us, we can endure almost anything if we could just recognize the joy that's before us in the kingdom of heaven that's waiting for us. If we could really honestly believe what God says is coming our way, we, we would have a snap in our step and, a, and joy. Yesterday I went to my mom's birthday party. She was 90 years old. She had all kinds of people there and phone calls coming in from around the country. And, and uh, she's 90. 
And you know what? She's got a lot of joy in her heart. You say, well, how can she have joy in her heart when her husband passed away a few years ago? How can she have joy in her heart when her daughter passed away about a year ago? How, how can she have joy in her heart? It's because she knows that she knows that she knows that someday she's going to be stepping over into that realm of glory, and they'll be together again. And it's not just a, uh, a fairy tale. It's, it's not just some kind of a story that you read in a book that you, gee, I sure hope it's true. No, she, she believes it. And she believes it so strongly that it's a reality. See, we need to believe God's word so strongly that it's a reality. I had a friend that was a minister. He said every now and then he'd fill up the bathtub with water and he'd step on it to see if he could walk on water. I said, well, you never will. You never will. He said, why? I said, because you're always seeing if it will work. That's not the way faith works. You don't fill up the tub and see if it'll work. Well, I think I'll give it a go. I'll, I'll step out of the boat. Well, you better have your life jacket on, fellow, because if you step out of the boat, and you're just going to see if it works. No, no, you've got to step out of the boat, and you know it works. You don't have to look down. You don't have to wonder if it's water. You know that you know that you know, and that's where we've got to be. And if we had that kind of confidence in the Word of God, if we had that kind of confidence in what he says, then we wouldn't have these hurts. We could go around this room, and, and we could, I could come up with at least six or seven of you that have had children pass. And there's probably nothing on this earth any more hurtful in the natural realm than to have a child go before the parent goes. I mean, what could be more hurtful than that for anybody? But God, but God gives us the strength, and he gives us the knowledge and the word and the truth that we know we know that this isn't the end they just stepped over into the next realm of glory we move from glory to glory to glory our best days are yet to come i had a guy tell me one time he said ben the best day in my life was the day i got saved i said yeah that should be the worst day of your life that's the day your life started every day after that should be getting better Every day should be getting better. Somebody says, well, we're getting older. No, I'm getting closer. I'm not getting older. I'm getting closer, you know. And when we get close, we should not fear death. How can you threaten a Christian with death? It's, somebody comes up, pulls a gun, and points it at me. Hey, it's just a one-way ticket home. Pull that trigger, and I'll be with the Lord. You'll still be here. <laughs> you can't threaten us with death. Well, offenses will come, but sadly, that's where most of the hurts come from, the secret hurts. Somebody has hurt us. Have you ever met someone who was so hurt that their life was destroyed, that they never, they never got over it? See, and, and the result of these secret hurts, which are not really all that secret, they may be secret in their content as to where they came from, but they manifest themselves in our relationships. And the result is broken relationships. We knew a lady one time, bless her heart, she loves the Lord, but she'd been married, I think, eight or nine times. Because something happened, and it totally broke her trust in men. Men can be trusted. Thank you, ladies, for your <laughs> massive applause. I said, men, for those of you watching, I said, men can be trusted, and the ladies just sat there. <laughs> but men, men can be, and men, women can be trusted. But once trust is broke, it's not always trust is just broke in that person, but trust can be broke in the entire gender. Are you following me? In that one of the two genders that there are. See, some people can't understand why they're not free, why they're not healed. Uh, and it's simply because of the hurts that they protect in their hearts. It affects their daily lives. It is really difficult to believe God when you're hurting. 
It's easier to believe God from a, from a standpoint of faith. And that is something that, that comes two different ways. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You want, you want faith? You want the word of God to be so alive in you? Well, then it comes by hearing the word of God. And here is God's word. People say, well, I just don't know what God wants me to do. Well, hey, don't be an idiot. He told you what to do. Right here it is. Everything in life we're supposed to do, he tells us right here. This is it. It's God's will. This is God's will. So if, uh, if you're a girl and you're thinking about marrying a girl and you're wondering what God thinks about it, well, then let me tell you something. Either you haven't been going to church or you've been going to a church that teaches a social gospel because I can tell you that God very clearly, clearly says what he thinks about it. And you don't have to wonder, you don't have to guess. All you got to do is read the will and testament here of our Lord and he tells you. But see, many times we get confused in life and, and we don't know what to do and we, we wonder because we don't know his word. We don't know his will. So these secret hurts. Let, let's talk about something for just a moment that might, uh, might surprise you a little bit. Not all of these hurts are your fault. You, you need to get rid of them, but they're not your fault. It's not your fault. It wasn't this man's fault that his dad beat him with a belt. Okay, permission to speak freely? I remember my dad beating me, beating me with a belt. You know why he beat me with a belt? Because I was a bad boy. I was a bad boy. Bad, bad boy. And if I would have been him, I would have beat me with a belt. I, I, think, I, I think I would have probably gone to a lead pipe. <laughs> knowing what I did. <clears throat> but you know what? I became a pastor. <clears throat> so it's not about whether your dad beat you with a belt or not. It's about how you react to it. Now, where do some of these hurts come from? Now, I'm going to tell you this. Now, sometimes it is your fault. Oh, now, that really draws a crowd when a preacher starts telling his congregation, this might be your fault. And I'm going to give you a biblical example. Let's go to Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Talking about when Jesus was taking a walk. He was going someplace. You're going to like this, Jim. You're going to love it. She told me to say that, your wife, po to point you out today to make sure that, you know, you're awake. Have you ever wondered why in our coffee shop they sell five hours stay awake? <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever wondered that? I have wondered that. It's for me, huh? <laughs> All right. Now, as he, this is Jesus, was going out on the road, one came running. Now, you've got to get this picture. Jesus is walking. And while he's walking, there is this guy, as they, as they say in, uh, in Kansas, he was running lickety-split. He was, I mean, he was running as fast as he could. And he ran faster than Jesus was walking. And he got in front of Jesus, and look what he did. He knelt down. Now, just get this picture. Jesus is walking along. This guy comes running from somewhere. And he gets in front of Jesus, and he kneels down. Well, what are you going to do when somebody kneels down in front of you? You know, like, Loretta, what do I usually do at the airport when people come up and run and start kneeling down in front of me? What do I normally do? Well, I mean, what, what do you guys do? <laughs> that was humor, by the way. Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher. Now, if you're going to talk to Jesus, you know, you've got you to start out good. Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now, let's go to the next verse. So Jesus said to him, why, why are you calling me good? No one is good but one, 
that is God. And he's recognizing Jesus, look, when he was here on earth, he was, yes, the Son of God. But he said over and over and over again, he came to earth as the Son of Man. He called himself the Son of Man. He wanted everyone there to know that everything he did on this earth, he was doing as a man. All the miracles he did, everything he did, any man on earth could have done those. The problem was there was no man on the earth really. Now there was a few prophets, you know, we had some prophets in the Old Testament. There was there were some times when the axe head would float and the waters would part and and there were some real supernatural things that happened in the Bible. But by and large, most people at the time Jesus was here was really religious. I mean, they were really they were really walking in religion. Yes, they believed in God. There were those who strongly believed in God. But it was very religious, very ceremonial. The priest dressed a certain way. Now, God told the priest to dress a certain way, but they kind of overdid some of this stuff. And they made rules and regulations. Yes, they weren't supposed to work on the Sabbath. They weren't supposed to. But like the, Robbie taught the other day, the man who was lame, Jesus said, pick up your bed. Well, that's what the Pharisees and the religious leaders got so mad about because Jesus told him to pick up his bed on the Sabbath, and on the Sabbath, that's work. Josephus tells that you could not even move pieces of furniture in your house because if you had a dirt floor, you would, might make a little groove in the ground, and that was plowing. And that's work. I mean, they got ridiculous. And even in Israel today, you go to Israel today, and we stayed on the 27th floor of this one hotel, and on the Sabbath, we got in the wrong elevator. We got in the Jewish elevator, and it stops at every floor. Why? Because pushing the buttons work. You can't push the button on the Sabbath. That's work. So you get in a Gentile elevator, and you push 27. Oh, well, whatever. At any rate, things, so he knelt down before Jesus, and Jesus was reminding him, you know, I'm here as the Son of Man. Now, he, he, he came as the Messiah, but you know, the, all, the, all the prophecies said that the, the Messiah would be a man. Jesus didn't come as God, he came as man. Okay, next verse. And then Jesus said to him, you know the commandments. Now, what was the question the guy asked? How can I have eternal life? Jesus said, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Go to the next verse, verse 20. And he answered and said to him, so here's what the guy said to Jesus, who was kneeling in front of Jesus. Teacher, all these things... I have kept from my youth. In other words, he was saying, hey, I've been taught those things in synagogue from a little kid, and I've been doing them. I've been honoring my mom and dad. I haven't committed adultery. I haven't lied. I haven't stolen. I mean, those things are wrong, and I have not done them. Even since I was a little kid, I haven't done them. Next verse, verse 21. Then Jesus looking at him, loved him. Let me tell you what. You, you talk to Jesus, I don't care what question you ask him. If it's honest from your heart, he'll look at you and he'll love you. We have the most loving God in the entire universe. You say, well, isn't he the only God? No, there are other gods. In fact, he said, put no other gods before me. But he is the only true God. He is the only loving God. In fact, God is love. He is the essence of love. He looked at, Jesus looked at him, loved him, and he said to him, okay, look, you've done all these things. You haven't committed adultery. You've honored your mom and dad. You haven't been a liar or a cheat or anything. You haven't defrauded anything. But there's one thing that you haven't done. And here's what you need to do. You need to leave from here. Just 
go away from here and sell whatever you have. Whatever you got, sell it and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Now, now let me tell you something. And here's where you've got to rightly divide the word of God. Jesus didn't tell the church to do that. He didn't tell everybody else to do that. That was a personal word from Jesus to that man for a specific purpose. Now, I'm just going to give you my opinion on this. My opinion on this is if the guy had done this, he would have been one of the disciples. Now, that's my opinion. My opinion may be wrong, so don't tell anybody that that's truth. But go, go your way, sell what you have, and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. He was, tell, he was giving that guy an invitation. What did he tell Peter? Leave your fishing boats and follow me. What did he tell everybody else? Leave your stuff. Follow me. What did he tell this guy? Sell what you have, give it to the poor, and follow me. Now look at the next verse, verse 22. But he was sad. Sad at what? He was sad at the word Jesus had given him. And he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. That man went to Jesus, and he, he wanted what so many people want. He wanted a word from the Lord. And he got a word from the Lord. Now, a well-known minister said one time, one word from God can change your life. Do you remember that? Heard it all the time on his national television broadcast. One word from God can change your life. Well, I kind of add to that a little bit, to his statement. One word from God can change your life for the good or for the bad. It depends on what you do with that word. This man had a choice. He could have sold everything, given it to the poor, and followed Jesus, and who knows? He could, have, he could have possibly written one of, the, one of the testaments. Who knows? He had great possessions. He could have given away a lot of stuff. What if God told me? What if God told you? What if he told one of us? Just one of us. Not the whole church, just you. What if he just picked out you and he told you to do that? Could you do that? Or would you leave sorrowful? Now, here's the thing. What happened to this guy? Oh, I, and there's all kinds of sermons on what happened to this guy. And most of them are theory. But I will say this. Uh, there's a good possibility that he lived out his life sorrowful with a hidden hurt. Knowing that he could have been. Knowing what could have been. Are you following me? Knowing what could have been. And that's where a lot of people are today. That's a lot of the hearts that hurts that they have in their heart is where could I have been had I married her or him? Or where would I be today if I would have just taken that job? Loretta's grandfather I loved him he was, they called him shorty but they called him shorty because he was so tall I mean th this guy was tall and I just loved it every time he they lived in uh, Huntsville Alabama and he worked for NASA he, he was actually a space scientist and uh, I loved it every time they'd come to Missouri he he was just a good old boy you know and he had all these stories he worked on Apollo 8 in fact we went to uh, with him into NASA and he showed us the wiring that he engineered on the inside of that band that goes around the space capsule I mean we actually got to go in there and he said see see those wires right there see those wires I designed those wires I decided they were going to be yellow you know <laughs> I mean it's kind of he's kind of a cool guy you know he's a cool guy but before he worked for NASA he worked for IBM 
Now, IBM at that time, you've got to understand, I mean, he, he's been, he's passed probably close to 20 years ago. So, I mean, we're talking back when computers weren't really computers. In fact, he told us the story. He said, when fax machines first came out, when a fax machine first came out, he said IBM knew about fax machines and had them developed 20 years earlier. But it took 20 years to get the technology to the market. And he said, when you, when you talk to people about how you could send pictures through a telephone line, they thought you were crazy. And look how old that technology is now. I had a company the other day down in Florida said, uh, send us a fax. We had, we had to get the dust off our fax equipment. You know, we, we, fax is just, but bottom line is this. Before he worked at NASA, he worked at IBM. And IBM was just beginning to develop, and he was in, involved in some of the early technology on their computers. <clears throat> and when they reached a certain place, they gave him an option. They said, Shorty, uh, we will give you a new house because he had something to do with the patents on this. We'll give you a new house or we will give you $5,000 worth of stock in IBM. This is back when IBM stock was, I mean, who'd ever heard of it? You know, IBM. Nobody even knew what it was, really. And he took the house. And several times, I, I bet pro it, since we had been married, I, I, we probably went there eight or ten times through the early years of our marriage to his house in Huntsville, Alabama. So he quit IBM, started working for NASA, and he had a new house, brand new house in the subdivision. Nice, all paid for. But that $5,000 worth of stock would have been, at his death, 20 to $25 million. And as that developed over the years, I remember him saying to me one time, I should have taken the stock. <laughs> I should have taken the stock. Well, now I, I'm going to tell you something. He did not let that hurt him. He lived a happy life. Always. But some people would have allowed that one mistake. It's kind of a mistake in a way. But he didn't know. How would he know? They would allow that one choice all those decades ago to ruin their life. As Christians, you cannot allow that to happen. Because let me tell you something. If you haven't made any bad choices, you're going to. I don't prophesy that. I'm just saying we are human. It's, it's no different than Jesus saying offenses will come. You say, well, that's a bad confession. No, that's a reality. Offenses will come. You are human. You cannot make 100% every single time the exact right decision on every financial thing, on every child thing, on, every, on everything in your life. You can be guided by the Holy Spirit, but you are still man. You are not God. But when you make a bad decision, you can't go away like this rich young ruler did and just be sorrowful and possibly be sorrowful and let it destroy your life and you, and you take down other people with you. That's what you. That's what you've got to realize, and that's the purpose of this message today. You are the light of the world. Jesus said that. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And then he goes on to say this, let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and they'll glorify the Father that's in heaven. Your light should radiate the goodness of God. But if you've got dark rooms sealed up in your heart and hurts that you don't talk about, you've got to get them cleaned up. It doesn't mean you've got to tell everybody everything that's in the room. There may be some things that are in that room you don't want anybody to know. You may have been molested when you're a child and you don't want anybody to know and you don't want to talk about it, but you can talk about it to God and you can get that room cleaned up. The Holy Spirit can go in there and the Holy Spirit can clean that room. The Holy Spirit can clean places that you don't think can ever be cleaned and by human hands and human counseling, they can't. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, 
cleansing can take place. And you can get those dark places in your heart cleared out. And you can live your life with a smile on your face and not have to all of a sudden you're watching television and something comes up about Epstein molesting people and you were molested when you were a kid and all of a sudden you just feel it oh, and you go into that dark place for a few moments. You try to cover it up and nobody in the room knows. But you know, wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice? that it just doesn't bother you anymore? Look, the Holy Spirit will not cause you to forget what happened, but you can forget the pain of it happening. Are you following me? You'll still remember it, but the pain will be gone. It will just be a historical event instead of being a hysterical event. Are you following me? So, the rich young ruler, he brought it on himself. He could have stayed with Jesus. He could have obeyed the word. Oh, my goodness. Can you imagine what, how his life would have changed if he would have just said, yes, Lord. But he made a wrong decision. Now, Jesus gets crucified. He's still around. He got another choice. Now he can become a Christian and let the Holy Spirit cleanse his heart. And he say. And he can say, yeah, there was a day when I, I probably could have been one of those disciples, but praise God, I'm in the kingdom. And I, You know what I mean? You can, you can have joy in the midst of pain. I uh, saw a video the other day of Auschwitz, and there were, the Jews were there. These guys had legs up near their hips that were that big around. They were no food, nothing. It was raining. Many of them, most of their families had been executed. And they were holding hands in a circle and they were dancing. And I thought to myself, here we are in America and we get upset if they left the tomato off of our Big Mac. You know what I mean? We're, we're out here. We're going, oh, I ruined my day. I've been looking forward to that chicken sandwich for, phew. my coffee was cold. They put too much sugar in my coffee. You work all day for sugar in your tay down by the railway. Drill, you tear your drill and whatever. And the Jews, with much of their family executed, with no food, their bodies are ruined almost any one of them could drop dead at any moment and they're holding hands and singing praises to God in the rain dancing I tell you what I'm not a real emotional person I'm really not I for some reason God just made me that way I'm just not real emotional but I could hardly talk when I saw that because here we are and and our secret hurts are things like, you know, I wanted to be on the cheerleading squad when I was in high school. <laughs> and those mean girls just wouldn't, those mean girls, I've lived with mean girls all my life. <laughs> you know, stupid stuff, most of it. Most of the things compared to everlasting life and most of the stuff we deal with, it's almost, it's almost like God doesn't do this, I'm sure, but I, it's almost like God's going, oh, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> you've been fasting three days for that? <laughs> you know? Oh, Lord. Don't let Lord Grantham die on Downton Abbey. Oh, Lord, just don't. You know, I remember years ago, we were watching television, and it was on the PTL Club, actually, many, many years ago. It was back before they all went to prison. And uh, they, <laughs> they had this prayer request, and this lady calls in, and she's wanting prayer for, I forget, uh, 
Rhonda or something. She's wanting prayer for Rhonda because her husband was cheating on her. And, and uh, I mean, they're, they're putting this on the air. They're not using any last names. And, and then uh, Lisa and her friend Lisa was giving her bad advice. And, and somebody else called in and said, hey, <laughs> that's days of our lives. You know, they're, they're, calling, that's, they're calling in for a soap opera. You know, Lisa, all these same people. <laughs> and this person had been watching the soap opera. And called in. The PTL had a prayer request. They put it on national television. Oh, Lord, don't let Lisa find out. About, you, know, whatever. <laughs> you know, sometimes we need to check up from the neck up to find out if we're really thinking right. So sometimes uh, these hurts can be because we call, caused them ourselves, but I want to take just a, a few brief moments uh, and mention some other things. Sometimes catastrophic, now follow me on this, catastrophic events in our lives that we can't seem to figure out why they happened can damage us to destroy our witness. What I was talking about a few moments ago is we've got to let our light shine. If the devil can keep you dull because of dark rooms and dark places, if he can keep your personality just what down to a point where you don't let the light shine. People are Christians many times because you are, or they're not Christians because you are. You know, we need to let our light so shine before men. Now, if you're walking around like that rich young ruler and you're all sorrowful and all day long, man, I made the wrong decision. Boy, did I blow it. What kind of a witness are you going to be? Or what if you have a catastrophic event happen in your life? And we've had them. We've all had them. That you don't understand. And you spend your life trying to figure out, why did God let this happen? I've been good, just like that rich young ruler, you know. I haven't committed adultery. I've honored my mother and dad. Why did this happen to me? God? God? Why me? Huh? Why me? I got an idiot that lives next door to me, never goes to church, stands out on the porch cussing out his wife and cussing his dog. He spits and urinates in the yard. I'm telling you, God, why not him? He's got a whole family full of kids, and they get together, and they have picnics at the, at the state park, and they all love each other, and they're all healthy and everything. Why me? Why my family? Why me? Huh? God? Why? Are you there? Hello? And you spend your life trying to figure out stuff. Hebrews 12, 15. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by this, by this what? Many become defiled. Why? Because of your root of bitterness. You get bitter? Joyce Meyer, I liked what she said years ago. You have a choice when things happen. Catastrophic things happen in your life. You got a choice. You can either get bitter or you can get better. You can get bitter or you can get better. You you just wallow in it and you'll get bitter. And when you go to talk to people, they'll help you get bitter. Well, you're right. You know, they, they'll help you get bitter. But you go to the Word of God and you'll get better. And the Word of God will help you get better. And you can get healed of this stuff and you can actually. Remember the catastrophic, catastrophic event as an event, but not as a pain. Are you following me? Now, another thing that causes uh, secret hurts is people speak words to you that cut your heart. Sometimes it happens from uh, when you're a kid. You know, your parents had 11 kids. They loved 10 of them. You know, one of them was the Cinderella, and it was you. Well, unfulfilled expectations. You could have 
hurts in your heart because, hey, look, by this time in my life, I thought I would be here. When I was here, I had it all planned out. I'd be here when I'm in my 30s and here in my 40s. And yeah, but now here I am, you know, here is where I was in my 20s, and now I'm in my 30s. I'm not where I thought I would be. Now I'm in my 40s. Unfulfilled expectations. You expect somebody else to do something. Let me tell you something about somebody else. Quit expecting anything about anybody, anything out of anybody else. Let me say that a little louder and a little stronger. Quit expecting anything out of anybody else other than yourself. You are responsible for the words that come out of your mouth. You're responsible for where you take your body. You're, ex you're responsible for who you sleep with. You are responsible for what you think. You are responsible for those things. Other people, you can't control them. And if the devil finds out he can control your emotions by messing with somebody else around you, he'll keep messing with them, and they may let him mess with them and keep you on a spiral constantly. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And another problem is, and it falls in with that too, not feeling appreciated. Well, I'll tell you what. I brought a casserole to the last five services, and every time less and less and less are eaten out of it. I really think there's a conspiracy among the deacons. <laughs> Tell everybody, well, you know, maybe you just salt it too much. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's just not the day people want spaghetti. Come on. Quit feeling like you're not appreciated. Now, here, here's something else. In that same psychological study, you know, that was 100% of the people have things hidden, a majority of the people don't feel appreciated. A majority of the people, all age groups, do not feel appreciated. So I think <coughs> that there's a word in the Scripture that says something along like this. Care not if you're appreciated. For God loves you, he does. <laughs> All right. And not getting your own way. How many of you like to get your own way? Get it your way. All right, well, praise the Lord. Okay, Philippians 4.11. We're going to close with one of these last 12 scriptures. That was humor also. Not that I speak in regard to need. Jim, we're going to have a Greek lesson. For I have learned whatever state I am to be content. Now, that doesn't mean whether you're in Florida or Kansas or whatever. Whatever state you're in, whatever's going on around you, whatever's going on, he has learned to be content. The Greek word there from, for learn is manthano. That's the Greek word, the ancient Greek word. And that means you've learned through study and experience. So that was what Paul was saying. He studied the scriptures and he's learned by experience. You might as well just be content no matter what's going on around you. Because whether you're content or not doesn't change what's going on around you. All right? You say, well, but... Pastor, I can't. Well, that takes me over to the next verse. Let's take a look at verse 12. Verse 12, Philippians 4, 12. There were 12 disciples. Okay. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. In other words, he, he can be poor, he can be rich, he can be down, he can be up. Everywhere and in all things I have manthano, manthano, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, 
both to abound and to suffer need. And somebody may say, well, but that was Paul. That was Paul the Apostle. Well, let's take a look at the next verse and see if you've ever heard this verse. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, about the time you say, well, that was Paul, have you ever quoted this scripture like a bazillion times? It's talking about, in context, Paul said he had learned through the scriptures and through experience that no matter what is going on around him, he can be content, and when he wonders how he can be content, he's got this. He knows this. He can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. The grace of God will empower you to be content when things don't seem content around you. So I want you all to stand up. And I want you to put your hands together like this. Put your fingertips together. All right? Now, I want you to act like you're grasping something with each hand. And what you're grasping is the doors to your heart. And we're going to open our hearts up to the Lord right now. Nobody else can see in your heart, but God can see your heart. And this is going to be our confession. Dear Heavenly Father, I open my heart to you. All of the rooms I have kept locked, I unlock now. And I open those doors to you. All the hurts and pains of the past, all the unfulfilled expectations, I'm sharing with you. I'm sharing with you. And, I'm and I'm asking through the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit. and through Christ, your Son, Christ, your Son. Who, strengthens me, who strengthens me that these rooms be cleaned out. Be cleaned out. I, give I give you permission to pour your Holy, your Holy Spirit throughout my heart, throughout my heart. and cleanse me I hurt, no more. I hurt no more. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Father, in the name of Jesus, I call forth the supernatural anointing of your Holy Spirit to minister to each and every person in this room. And to reveal to them that it's done. It's done. It's done. It's over. Pain no more. Hurt no more. Secrets they've been hiding from themselves. No more. Just peace. In the name of Jesus. Amen.